Okay. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, my name is uh, Atreya Vedantam. Uh, I am from Chennai. Uh, I am currently uh, doing the B.Tech in IIT Madras uh, in the branch uh, Electrical Engineering. So today uh, I am going to explain uh, the chapter Electromagnetic Waves. So uh, first, a brief uh, a brief uh, introduction to electromagnetic waves. Well, what are electromagnetic waves? We see that there are two words, electro and magnetic, right? So yeah, that's self-explanatory. Basically, these are waves which are which are made up of a, both an electric field as well as a magnetic field. So these uh, these waves consists of an, an electric field vector as well as a magnetic field vector. So here uh, here. This, this introduction is, is devoted to how uh, how Maxwell finds out that there is a the there's a the how how the displacement current is a concept that was created to solve the error in this um, uh, Ampere's uh, circuital law. So the problem with Ampere's circuital law is that this is only true in magnetostatics. So it's not true when magnetic uh, fields are changing with time. So this is only true in magnetostatics. Okay. Yeah. So so therefore there needed to be a correction term for it to be universally valid. So that uh, this is basically the derivation for the uh, for that correct correcting term. So finally you have uh, the with the extra factor epsilon d phi e by dt added, which will give you the corrected Ampere's Maxwell law here. So now. Uh, this makes it makes the loss of electrodynamics more symmetrical between electricity and magnetism. So these are the four Maxwell's equations. They are uh, quite important. Uh, these these uh, laws uh, constitute Maxwell's equations together. Now, uh, uh, now we have our. Uh, uh, so similarly, now we have electromagnetic waves. Now, electromagnetic waves are simply waves which uh, have an electric and magnetic fields. So, uh, how are they created? Well, and any any accelerating charge, any accelerating charge, uh, you know, it can be a rotating charge or anything. Accelerating charges produce electric and magnetic fields. That's because we know that a static static uh, charge produces an electric field, right? We know that a moving charge produces a magnetic field. But we also know that when the magnetic field is changing, a changing magnetic field produces an electric field. And just now what we have figured out in the first part of this chapter is that a changing electric field also produces a magnetic field. Therefore, these two power each other and uh, we have a electromagnetic wave that is generated in space. So, uh, basically, so this is this part is about why 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 the the, part, the proof of uh, uh, the light being an electromagnetic wave. If we were to if we were if we had instruments which can set up currents which are alternating at a frequency of around 16 to 10 to the power 14 hertz here, then we can see that yellow light would be generated out of this, and then we'll be able to see is yellow. However, we don't have instruments which are capable of producing this. Therefore, it's not the test that light is an electromagnetic wave is not a very simple one. So finally, uh, we know that uh, there are a few very important uh, uh, formulae involved in this chapter. First is these two. These two denote the formulae for electric and magnetic fields in uh, space and time. So uh, as you can see, an important uh, an important fact here is the electric field is always perpendicular to the magnetic field. In other words, the dot product is zero. Okay. And another very important fact is the magnitude of the electric field is always the speed of light times the magnitude of the magnetic field. This is an important formula. This is an important formula. These two are important. And then this is this is a, this is a formula that's already done probably in waves and uh, sound. But this basically uh, how uh, k in the propagation vector is related to uh, wavelength. So uh, here, and this is another important formula, c is equal to 1 by 
root of mu naught epsilon naught. Mu naught and epsilon naught are perme permeability and permittivities of free space. T is a speed of light. In a in a in a medium, this becomes one by square root of mu e mu epsilon. How does this uh, how is this uh, uh, how does this formula come from? Well, you need to use Maxwell's equations, and that is uh, beyond uh, you know twelve standard. It has to do with uh, uh, you will learn about you know something called curl. Okay, you will learn about these various forms of loss, which are which are not necessary right now. Okay, uh, so you will need to you will need to use these in order to derive this formula. So right now we just accept it, uh, accept that this is the formula. Okay, so yeah, here's the formula given. B naught is always E naught by C. This is very important. Another uh, another well known formula is uh, that the wavelength into the frequency is the speed of light. So that that is an important formula given here. Now, uh, so so uh, now if we go a bit a bit down, we find uh, we find that uh, uh, you know. Uh, Electric fields have uh, uh, so the energy energy density of an electric field, right? Uh, so the, the basically the energy of an electric field is given by half epsilon naught e square energy density. Remember, okay, this is energy per unit volume, okay. And uh, similarly, for a magnetic field, this is half one by mu naught b square. You see the similarity in the form, right? So. Uh, so in an electromagnetic wave, both of these, we have an electric field as well as a magnetic field. Therefore, they get added. Um, so, but we know that the electric field intensity and magnetic field intensity keep changing over time, right? So uh, the net energy is uh, the total energy of the wave. Okay, so you add both the energy. So now we have something called uh, radiation pressure. This is the fact that light carries momentum, okay? So light has a dual nature, something that I'll cover in, in a different chapter. It can behave as both a particle as well as a wave. It's called wave particle duality. So uh, if you consider it as like a particle, then it has something called a momentum, right? Every particle even has a, a mass and a velocity. However, the momentum of light is slightly de differently defined. So the momentum of light is from the de Broglie's formula. So I, I won't get much into that. But you know that uh, the Broglie wavelength is h by p, right? So that's the momentum of a light wave in this kind, h by l. So now you have uh, radiation pressure. Radiation pressure is uh, the energy transmitted by the speed of light. Okay. So uh, now it depends on what this light wave is doing. If you are completely absorbing surface, then the pressure is simply uh, P is equal to U by C. However, if it's a reflecting surface, then uh, it's going to fall and reflect. So that's what P is actually 2U by C. So that's an important difference. So now we have the electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum is simply the spectrum the, for, the, for different wavelengths and frequencies. What is the kind of rays that you get? So once we immediately notice, why, why do you think that there is 10 to the power 2, what is, what is directly up, across something like 10 to the power 2? It is roughly around, you know, 3 into 10 to the power 6, right? The reason for this is lambda into uh, nu is equal to C. The frequency into the wavelength is always the speed of light. So, uh, you know, at any given point, at any given horizontal line, the, freak, the, the frequency on this side and the wavelength on this side should multiply to the speed of light. So that's why you have, uh, you know, that, that should be a speed of light, 3 and 10 to 8 meters per second. Okay. Anyway, the spectrum is pretty, uh, uh, it's a pretty theoretical uh, thing. It's something to know. So you have radio waves at extremely long wavelengths. Remember, 10 to the power 3 is 1 kilometer, right? And this is 100 kilometers. So these are extremely long radio waves. You have short radio waves, microwave, infrared. So one thing you should remember is definitely uh, the approximate uh, uh, wavelengths. If so you can choose either to remember your frequencies or wavelengths. Okay. Uh, my my personal choice is wavelengths. 
because of this right you can you can see that the light light goes from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers and that is something worth remembering because it, it, it uh, comes up repeatedly you know in coordination compost in chemistry it is something that you need to do later when you you know uh, when you go in in your future you will be able, you'll be doing spectroscopy in some field or the other and at that moment you need to know you need to use uh, for nuclear magnetic resonance you need to know uh, these wavelengths okay so this will end up being useful at least a visible light one thing you can appreciate is that visible light forms a very narrow part of the spectrum it's, it's very 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 small and you can see that electromagnetic waves are therefore the generalized form of light so this is really what we call light so because this is what we can actually see but as you can see it's a very small part of what is uh, really you know the entire electromagnetic spectrum so and then this is these are just a few descriptive uh, descriptions of each type of wave one thing to notice is that there is no specific difference you can see that many of these things overlap right the, the reason they overlap is there is no particular uh, there is a sharp cutoff between one type uh, as against another so these are this is description and then yeah this is just a table uh, this is a table uh, you know with a brief summary of all the thing so again this summarizing uh, maxwell found the inconsistency in the ampere circuit alla so integral b dot dl is now mu not i enclosed plus mu not epsilon not d phi e by dt so that is the that is thing okay so that is the new law that is the new ampere circuit law that is called uh, ampere maxwell law and uh, this essentially means that a changing uh, changing uh, electric field produces a magnetic field and a changing magnetic field produces an electric field this makes it more symmetric so symmetry is something that uh, you know that nature likes right it is something that appeals to us aesthetically uh, however uh, elect electricity and magnetism must be not perfectly symmetrical for example you know that uh, you know that uh, uh, the flux of magnetic field integral b dot da is always zero that is the gauss of law for magnetism right what does this mean this means that there are no magnetic monopoles ever that's a very interesting thing but you do know that there are uh, electrical monopoles that, that's what charges are right you have integral e dot da is q enclosed by epsilon not clearly non zero right so that is a, that there is still some degree of asymmetry here so that's the but that's apart from that this this makes it more symmetric now uh, an accelerating charge produces electromagnetic waves is a very important concept uh, if an electric charge oscillates with a with a frequency of v it produces an electromagnetic wave the same frequency v that should make sense because if a charge is moving let us say simple harmonically up and down it is going to produce a sinusoidal wave right it makes sense that when it comes down the wave produced and when it goes up it produces a wave here so the frequency of this wave it's equal to the frequency of how how fast the charge is moving up and down So it's equal. These two frequencies are equal. Now, electromagnetic waves with the wavelength of orders few meters. So this this is just a bit of history. So he verified the basic prediction of Maxwell's equations. Now these are just formulae for electric and magnetic fields, right? Uh, and this is this is just comes from the theory of waves. So you know that uh, you know the general general sum of a wave is some function of x minus v t. This is v in general wave equation. Like here, v is equal to uh, lambda by t, right? It's a it's a wavelength for time period. So what you do is uh, you define k as two pi two pi by lambda, and you define omega equals two uh, pi by t, and you say that the new speed of the wave is therefore omega by k, right? And with that, you can reconstruct this equation into f of k x minus omega t, and that's exactly what they have done here. Okay, so that and then this is another important part which is revised. We went through. This is the speed of light in a medium. So uh, v is equal to one by epsilon mu. We did. We we showed that this is possible to be derived from Maxwell's equations in the differential form. Okay, so 
with more on that later that's not necessary similarly this is a uh, radiation pressure and one thing that they haven't mentioned is uh, the momentum of the of light wave is h by lambda is its wavelength okay so yeah uh, so that is the chapter uh, we can go on to the exercises so there are totally there are 10 exercises so we look at the first problem so this figure shows a parallel plate capacitor parallel plate capacitor uh, with two circular plates each of radius 12 cm and separated by 5 cm right so uh, it has uh, it is uh, sub ra ra radius is 12 cm so we'll call that r and we'll call the separation as uh, 5 cm d is equal to 5 okay now now we are capacitors being charged by an external source and the charging current is a constant of 0.15 amperes okay first calculate the capacitance and rate of change of potential distance capacitance is simple we know that the formula for capacitance is epsilon naught a by d so in this case it's epsilon naught a is uh, pi r squared right by d d is simply uh, we also know d so this is a easily calculatable constant right i think epsilon naught is 8.89 and 10 to the power minus 11 into uh, 3.14 into r squared which is uh, 144 but centimeters so you multiply by 10 to the power to get si units d is 5 into 10 to the power minus 2 meters so this is a uh, this is uh, the capacitance now you have rate of change of potential difference between the plates so now an important fact that we know is that uh, q is equal to cv which means dq by dt is equal to c dv by dt we need to find this we need to find the rate of change of potential difference right dv by dt so um, how but we do we, we already know dq by dt dq by dt is simply current we know that we know that current is 0 0.15 amperes right so therefore we know that uh, uh, dv by dt is simply 0 0.15 amperes divided by capacitance we would have found out some capacitance here right so use that here okay so that is also uh, easily solved now obtain the displacement current across the plates what is the displacement current again going back to maxwell's equation the complete Maxwell's equation now is the integral of the magnetic field around the closed loop is equal to mu naught i enclosed plus mu naught epsilon naught d flux of the electric field. Sorry, there's no vector. Electric flux is a scalar, right? d phi by dt. What is the displacement current? This term is called a displacement current, id. Because it it behaves like another current, which you know, kind of pseudo current, which uh, which doesn't exist, right? That that's that's what uh, that's why it's called displacement current. Now, uh, so how do you find displacement current? It, what, what is the electric flux? So you know that the electric flux is given by E into A here because the area is perpendicular to uh, the electric field. Uh, but you know that the electric field is again, uh, you know, sigma by epsilon naught, right? This electric field in a capacitor is sigma by epsilon naught. Note that uh, it's always uh, like this, facing like this. So it's always perpendicular to the area, okay? So that's why there's no uh, cos theta term because cos of zero is one. Now what is sigma? Sigma is a charge density, charge or uh, area surface charge density. Surface charge density is uh, the charge by area. So sigma into A is simply the charge. So this is simply Q by epsilon, not. Now, therefore, what we want is d phi E by dt. d phi E by dt is simply 1 by epsilon not d Q by dt. Right? Now, what is, uh, now, 
we know we know we already know that dq by dt uh, dq by dt is the current right uh, so which means id so i'll uh, pick another color id is simply uh, epsilon naught d phi e by dt and as we found uh, here as we found there is simply epsilon naught into 1 by epsilon naught into dq by dt which means id is equal to dq by dt but we already know dq by dt dq by dt is simply the current and the current is 0 0.15 amperes so this is simply 0 0.15 amperes okay now part c is a kirchhoff's first rule valid at each plate of the capacitor explained so what is kirchhoff's first rule junction rule the junction rule is also alternatively called Kirchhoff's current law. It basically says that charge cannot accumulate over time. That means at any instant, at any point, right, uh, the, the rate of change of charge density, right, should be zero. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, so Kirchhoff's law says that whatever current come, whatever current is coming in or for a given branch must always come out. The charge cannot build here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, so is this true? Well, what is the charge that's coming in? So current the current that's coming in is I. We know that, right? From the because that, that is that is what's given. But you know that the displacement current, which is the charge leaving this plate, is also I. So therefore, Kirchhoff's uh, law is not valid. Therefore, Kirchhoff's first rule is valid. Yes. And, and this is the explanation given. Okay. Okay, now we move to the second problem. The second problem states that the parallel plate capacitor has a R is equal to 6 meters. Right, that's R. It has a capacitance of 100 picofarad. Pico is 10 to the power minus 12. So this is the capacitance. The capacitor is connected to a 230 volt AC. And the frequency is 300 hertz. 300 uh, per second. This is the angular frequency. What is the RMS value of the conduction current? Okay. What is conduction current? Conduction current is just simply the normal current. Now, we know that uh, since it's an AC circuit, we have to use uh, reactances. So what is the capacitor? This is a capacitor, right? There's no resistor here. So what is the capacitive reactance? Capacitive reactance is often is given by chi C, which is equal to 1 by J omega C, where J, uh, okay, no, uh, actually, okay, I ignore that. It's 1 by omega C. With a, with a phase of uh, minus pi by 2. Okay? And the reason is to ignore that is it, if, if I write a, a, a j, if I write a, a j is essentially square root of minus 1. Uh, I have to also describe, uh, you know, how complex numbers came into this and how complex numbers correspond to rotation. Right? But let's not get into all that. Let's just say that uh, the the react the reactance the capacitor reactance of this capacitor is one by omega c. What does the capacitor reactance mean? It just means that the impedance, basically, the the resistance equivalent in an AC circuit is given by this value. So the current, what is the conduction current? Current we all know that by Ohm's law, uh, current is voltage by the the uh, resistance, right? The resistance equivalence is the capacitor reactance. So in this case, it is it is this. So uh, clearly, we are asked to find the RMS of the. Uh, this is true for any given instant of time, okay. But right now, uh, we are only asked for RMS. So I RMS is V RMS into omega C. V RMS is the uh, when they when they when they tell you that there is an AC supply of two thirty volts, they automatically mean that two thirty volts is the RMS. Okay, that's a very very important point. This is not the peak. Remember that 230 volts is not the peak voltage. It is the RMS voltage. Okay, so the peak voltage will actually be 230 times square root of 2. Anyway, so this is going to be uh, 230 into omega, omega is 300 into C, which is 100 into 10 to the power minus 2. 
Sixty-nine into the power minus seven amperes. Okay, so that is I R minus. Now, uh, what is if the conduction current equal to the displacement current? So, what is the displacement current again? Again, it's just some previous derivation. Uh, as you can clearly see, that this is the this is the displacement current. Again, uh, a similar because these two are kept parallel rate capacitors, we don't need to derive again, right? So, this is the same formula. This, this formula is here. Applicable for this situation, which means the displacement current is again dQ by dt, which means that is the same same as the current is coming in, right? So yes, the answer is yes. Determine the amplitude of magnetic field at three three centimeters on the axis between the plates. Yes, so three centimeters there. We are asked to find the magnetic field. So what do we do? Well, we all know this kind of uh, question, right? Uh, this kind of question is basically a, uh, it is a Amperean circuit law. You have to use uh, so the integral b dot dl, right? So you use a Maxwell's fourth equation. Use this equation basically. If you use this equation, you will get integral b dot dl. So if you look at the the the, the line that line integral, right? That line integral will become will correspond to two pi into three centimeters, right? But that value equals I enclosed zero because between the capacitors there is no uh, free current, right? There is only the displacement current. So uh, uh, so is equal to uh, mu naught epsilon naught. We know that epsilon naught d uh, d phi e by d t. Is simply uh, uh, 69 into 10 to the power minus 7 into root 2 into some sine omega t. How did I get that? Well, you know that this is the IRMS, right? So what is a what is the uh, what is I as a function of time? Well, it is I R F R R M S will be the <laughs> IRMS is basically the amplitude divided by square root of 2, right? That's how you get RMS. So therefore the amplitude must be IRMS into square root of 2. Into some sinusoidal function, okay. That is that is what uh, an alternating current does, right? So, uh, uh, so, so some sinusoidal. This remember that sinusoid has the same frequency as that of the source, right? Three hundred uh, omega equals three hundred. So this is the uh, general uh, ID. So you can find B. Uh, B will simply be uh, B will simply be uh, uh, the we we just want the amplitude of B, right? So if you want amplitude to be, then the sine omega t doesn't matter, right? Because uh, you just want the maximum possible value. So uh, that that uh, you can it clearly can solve b, right? And b is if you just divide by this this quantity, you will get b as some number. So that is possible to solve. Uh, no, what physical quantity is the same for X-rays of wavelength? Uh, 10 to the power minus 10, red line, red light of this wavelength, and radio waves of some other wavelength. Well, what is same? Well, if wavelength is some some given quantity, remember that lambda into frequency is speed of light, and the speed of light is always constant. This is something that you cannot change in vacuum, especially. So the answer is uh, speed of light. Okay. A plane electromagnetic wave travels in the vacuum on the z edge. What can you say about directions of electric and magnetic field vectors? Okay, this is something that I don't think I've done. I think I've not told to this yet. But the direction of the speed of light, the direction of light is always equal to the cross product of the directions of the electric and magnetic fields. This is a very important concept. Basically, if you use your right hand on the wood, right? When your thumb electric field is wrap it around the magnetic field like that, your thumb will point out uh, out at the board, right? That is what the, that is the direction of the light wave. So uh, obviously, uh, can you see the why this is an incorrect diagram? Yeah, electric and magnetic fields are obviously perpendicular to each other. Okay. Anyway, now we go. Uh, so what can you say about the directions of electric and magnetic field vectors? Well, if this is the z direction, so uh, you know that this is equal to the z cap, right? Because it is traveling around the z direction. 
So, uh, sorry, K cap. I mean, uh, Z cap is something you use. Okay. So K cap in Cartesian coordinates, right? In Cartesian coordinates, K one, which means these both must be in the in the x y plane. They can be they they need not be along the x and y axis because they can be in any other orientation. But they must be perpendicular. That's one condition, and they should be in the x y plane. So they are mutual. So that's what you can say about them. If the frequency is 30 uh, megahertz, what is the wavelength? Uh, this is simple enough to calculate. Again, formula required is lambda into v equals c. Frequency is 30 into 10 to the power 6 into lambda, which we don't know, is 3 into 10 to the power 8. So uh, lambda is 10. A radio can tune in to any station in the 7.5 megahertz to 12 megahertz band. What is the corresponding wavelength band? Well, uh, when if if it can tune into at at the very least 7.5 megahertz, then the maximum possible wavelength that it can tune into is the speed of light divided by that. Can you see why? Because okay, I'll explain. Again, the formula is lambda v equals c. So lambda equals c by v. So if if, if the denominator can range between 7.5 megahertz and 12 megahertz, this lambda can weigh between c by uh, 7.5 and c by 12, right? So that's what we're trying to calculate. That is the general gist of the uh, what we're trying to solve. So now it's just calculation. 3 into 10 to the power 8 by 7.5 into 10 to the power 6 is simply 300 by 7.5. Which is six hundred by fifteen, which is forty. So forty meters is the maximum. Remember, okay. What is the minimum though? Minimum is three into ten to the power eight by twelve into ten to the power six, which is hundred by four, which is twenty-five. So twenty-five meters is the minimum. So that is the. Those are the answers for eight point five, eight point six. A charged particle uh, oscillates about mean equilibrium point with a frequency of 10 to the power 9 hertz. What is the frequency of the electromagnetic wave produced by the uh, oscillator? 10 to the power 9 hertz. Again, remember this concept. This concept here. Uh, this concept. If an electric charge oscillates harmonically with a frequency of nu, it produces the electromagnetic wave at the same frequency nu, which means. If the oscillator is oscillating at 10 to the power 9 hertz, then it also produces a uh, electromagnetic wave of 10 to the power 9 hertz frequency. Okay, one more point to note. Generally, is a good idea. Is that when they only say frequency, they mean nu is 10 to the power 9. Okay, omega is therefore 2 pi nu. Okay, which means the angular frequency you have to multiply 2 pi. Only they, if they mention angular, you have to take it as omega. Okay, so some people get confused with that. They don't know whether a given frequency is angular or not. If it is not mentioned, then assume that it is the uh, if it that it is not the angular frequency. Okay, okay, eight point seven. The amplitude of the magnetic field uh, part of the uh, part of harmonic electric elect electromagnetic wave is given to be some some beam. What's the amplitude of the electric part of the wave? This is a formula that we have already covered. E naught is equal to C B naught. Remember that. So B naught is given as 510. So this is 3 into 10 to the power 8 into 510 into 10 to the power minus 9, which is 63, 63 volt per meter. So 63 newtons per coulomb is also a way to do it. So a good so even though volt per meter and newton per coulomb are the same, right? Uh, we prefer this for waves because you know it's a more abstract definition. Of, uh, it gives you an uh, idea, right? It 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 tells you that uh, electric field is really the the you know the gradient of potential, right? It is that is basically it tells you the 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 uh, it's the derivative of velocity with In in the space, right? Minus b d by t x. So I just prefer. I mean, both are same. It's fine actually. Okay, eight point eight. Suppose that the electric field amplitude of an electromagnetic wave is one twenty newton per coulomb, 
and that its frequency is 50 uh, megahertz determine all these quantities okay first we determine b naught again the formula is uh, already known so which means b naught is e naught by c naught c 120 by 3 into 10 to the power 8 4 into 10 to the power minus 7 tesla okay that is b naught so that's done now omega omega is 2 pi nu 2 pi into 50 into 10 to the power 6 hertz which is 314.15 mega that's also done now what is k now the speed of light uh, uh, we already covered this is omega by k so which means k is equal to omega by c which is 314.15 megahertz by 3 into 10 to the power 8. So this is again, this is just pi. So k is simply pi. Now we know that by definition k is equal to the propagation factor is 2 pi by lambda. But you know that lambda is, the k is pi, right? So pi is equal to 2 pi by lambda. So what should lambda be? So there you go. So we have uh, covered uh, all the uh, all the things, right? Uh, so yeah. Uh, now uh, we need to find expressions for electric and magnetic fields. Now we are not sadly we are not given. This is a very ambiguous question because we are not given any you know any vector uh, uh, constraints. Like we are not given any situation. We are not given that the the way the light wave is traveling along a certain direction or something. So we'll make a few assumptions. Okay, let's just draw the XYZ plane. Okay, so let's say this is the X, this is the Y, this is Z. Remember very careful uh, point to note while drawing a con system that some students may make is that you don't have the freedom to put X, Y, and Z anywhere you want. You have to put, once you decide X and Y, Z is decided in such a way that X cross Y should be in the direction of Z. Okay, this is called the right-handed coordinate system. And most of the physics that we use today is in the right-handed system. You're going to end up making a few mistakes. If you use, for example, if I were to if I were to accidentally do this, right? I'm going to draw one more coordinate system, which we see, which will appear that it's it's fine. X, Y, Z. This is the issue. I know I want to make a lot of mistakes if I do this because X cross Y will end up being minus Z. But it is supposed to be Z in the in the right-handed coordinate system supposed to be said okay so anyway as we were we, we will draw the current system we assume that this is x this is y this is z the light wave is traveling along this thing uh, the the z cap so and we will say that the electric field is on the is is electric field is facing the x direction so so we will say e is equal to e naught which is 120 sine kx, k is uh, pi minus omega t, omega, sorry, k is not pi. Uh, uh, okay, but then I, I, I don't remember, but you know, we found out k here, right? We found out omega. So use that k here and then use that omega here. And then uh, the direction is uh, i cap. Similarly, b, you know, you know the, we know the value of b naught, we just found out b naught here. Uh, it, it's again sine and j cap. Basically, use the equations that are given here. Here, here you see that both the equations are in phase, right? That's an important thing in EM waves. The electric and magnetic fields are in phase. That that is, they are always, you know, uh, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, so that, that's so that's how you can find expressions for uh, uh, the electric and magnetic fields. Okay. The terminology in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum is given in the text. Use the use the formula E is equal to H nu for energy of a quantum of radiation photon and obtain the photon energy in units of electron volts for different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the terminology is for different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum is given in the text. So that uh, they are giving you different uh, wavelengths and different frequencies for different types of waves, like radio waves and infrared waves, right? Visible, visible waves, uh, ultraviolet, etc. Uh, now, uh, 
you know that every uh, for a for a photon the energy is given by e square h this is the famous planck's equation right so so let's say let's say we have a you know let's say we have a wavelength of 400 meter, nanometers that corresponds to violet light okay i'm just going to do one example it's very easy to do it for other things once you know the general format of how to do it for one so you know Planck's constant is 6.63 in 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. I urge you to remember this value. So useful constant into the frequency. The frequency is simply given by the speed of light, which is 3 in 10 to the power 8 meters per second, divided by wavelength. Wavelength is 400 in 10 to the power uh, 4 10 to the power minus 9. So you end up with the uh, I tend to go of 17 in the numerator, which gives you 10 to the power minus 17 when it tends to. You're going to 6.63 into 3, which is around 20. So this is roughly, uh, uh, so this is roughly around this, okay, which is around 510 to the power minus 19 joules. This is an extremely tiny quantity of energy, and therefore we normally do not prefer to use uh, the units joules because we want to. Uh, because we want, you know, we want to deal with, humans are not very good at dealing with extremely small numbers, right? So we want to deal with, uh, uh, so we want to deal with uh, 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 reasonable numbers. So what we do is we, we convert it to electron volts. One electron volt is 1.16 in the 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb, right? That's, that's an electron into one volt. One coulomb into one volt is one joule, right? We know this. So this is 1.6 in 10 to the power minus 19 joules. So if we have something like 5 in 10 to the power minus 19 joules, we can write this as approximately 3 electron volts. Now 3 electron volts is something that we can all understand properly and deal with. So that's how we uh, convert, convert joules to electron volts and represent the energies of different uh, spectra of the electromagnetic spectrum accordingly. Okay, now uh, 10 to 1. In a plane electromagnetic wave, the electric field oscillates sinusoidally with some frequency and an amplitude. What's the wavelength of the wave? So the wavelength of the wave is uh, pretty simple. Uh, we know that again from this formula, lambda into V is equal to C, which is 3 in a 10 to the power 8, which means that uh, uh, V is 3 in a 10 to the power 8 divided by 2 in a 10 to the power 10 which is 1.5 in the 10 to the power minus 2 uh, meters, which is 1.5 1, 1 centimeters. So that is a wavelength of the wave, okay? What is the amplitude of the oscillating magnetic field? Again, we have something, this something we've done all the time. B naught is E naught by C. E naught is 48 by 3 in the 10 to the power 8. So this is 16 in the 10 to the power minus 8 is lag. No show that the average density of an electric field equals the average density of the magnetic field. So now, as, as I said before, the total energy is given by half epsilon naught E squared plus 1 by 2, 1 by mu naught B squared, right, at, a, at any given instant of time. Now, uh, we know that at any instant, at any instant, at any instant, uh, the electric field is C times the magnetic field, right? Which means the electric field squared, which is E squared, is C squared B squared, fine? Now we know that uh, C is equal to 1 by root of mu naught epsilon naught. This is something that, you know, I mentioned in the beginning of the chapter. I said the derivation requires magnetic Maxwell's equations in, in other forms which, which are not yet known to 12th, 12th level. So which means that uh, e, e, uh, so sorry. So yeah, so P squared equals 1 by mu naught epsilon naught B squared at any given instant of time, remember, right? Which means epsilon naught E squared is always equal to 1 by mu naught B squared which means half epsilon naught e squared is equal to 1 by mu naught b squared. So, yeah. So, so therefore, over an average, they are equal. 
Now the additional exercises are uh, basically of the same nature. Basically, um, again, remember that if the electric field is in the I-cap direction, right? So the magnetic field could be anywhere. It could be, um, uh, like, let's say the magnetic field is in the J-cap direction. Then uh, the direction of propagation will be in a K-cap direction. What is the wavelength? Well, we know that wavelength is 2 pi by K. Because we know that K is equal to 2 pi by lambda, right? The propagation constant equals 2 pi by the wavelength. So, <laughs> Lambda is simply 2 pi by k. k is 1.8. So it's uh, 2 pi by 1.8, which is pi by 0 0.8. What is the frequency in nu? Nu is simply uh, omega by 2 pi, which is 5.4 into 10 to the power 6 by 2 pi, because it's omega. This is E naught. Amplitude of magnetic field is simply E naught by C. E naught is given as 3.1 into 10. 3.1. So divided by 3 in 10 to the power 8 corners is the amplitude of the magnetic field. Right? Uh, then write an expression for the magnetic part of the wave. This is simply B naught. We found out that B naught is uh, 3.1 by 3 in 10 to the power minus 8. Right? Yes, sir. This is the answer. B naught cos omega. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. My bad. I made a mistake. So here, as you can see, as you can see. Uh, you're given y here. That means that the, uh, uh, the field is traveling along the j-cap direction. Which means if your electric field is along i-cap, and the field is traveling along j-cap, the magnetic field is along the minus k-cap. Uh, sorry, the, the, the direction of propagation is along j-cap. Okay, that's an important thing to note. So, in fact, if I amend my... Uh, yeah, so here, you, start, you know, you can find... If, you're, if you choose I cap and J cap, the electric and magnetic field will simply have a Z here. You know, KZ minus omega T. Right? That is that is because the, the direction of propagation is K cap. Okay. That's an important thing to note. Uh, uh, so this is omega Y minus, sorry, uh, KY. KY minus omega T uh, and minus Z cap. Minus K cap. And we know K, we know omega, all of these are the same constants carry forwarded from the electric field expression. And the B naught is simply the electric A E naught divided by the speed of light. Uh, 8.12. About 5% of the uh, 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 power of a 100 watt the light bulb is converted to visible radiation. What is the average intensity of visible radiation at a distance of 1 meter from the bulb? Well, one thing we can see that is that intensity, uh, intensity from a bulb, Intensity from a bulb goes as 1 by r squared. Okay, this is something that is a good thing to note. So we know that there's 100 watt bulb and 5% is connected to light. So 5% of 100 watts is really the power that is output in form of light, right? Is the power held in the light. So therefore, you basically only have 5 watts. So 5 watts uh, at a distance of uh, the, what is the average intensity? Intensity is always given by power by area. So the power is always 5. The area is pi into r squared, which is 1 squared. So that is the power. That is the intensity, I mean, okay? At 1 meter. The intensity at 10 meters is simply going to be 5 by pi into 10 squared. So that is also these two are done. This is obviously, the this comes from a lot of assumptions. So assuming that the power is emitted isotropically. What does isotropically mean? It is the same in all directions. It means that you, if you change your orientation, you do not know, you, like it does not make a difference. Basically, it has a radial symmetry. That is why you can assume that the power to be distributed over the area you found. Okay. Use a formula, a lambda t into lambda m into t is equal to 0 0.29 centimeter Kelvin to obtain a characteristic temperature range for different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. What do the numbers to obtain tell you? So, this is a very interesting law. Okay. It's called a uh, it's called the Wien's displacement law. Okay, so it tells you that the maximum that every every substance has a range of temperature, uh, ra range of wavelengths over it over which it, it emits the uh, uh, its its uh, uh, radiation, and that there is a certain maximum wavelength corresponding to 
temperature and that if you increase this temperature this wavelength becomes smaller okay basically this is a this is a radiation this is a radiation emit power power emitted with lambda you can see there is a certain lambda mass right for which there is a maximum amount of power emitted as you as you increase the temperature this peak shifts to the right and higher obviously higher because obviously you have increased the temperature and more power is emitted because power is proportional to uh, t to the power 4 this is uh, from stefan's law okay so yes uh, so you, if you have a certain electromagnetic spectrum this certain for example let's say you have uh, again let's just take violet light for example so yeah, for for violet light you have 400 nanometers which means that the temperature at which you get maximum amount of violet light is what 0 0.29 centimeters divided by 400 to 10 to the power minus 9 which is basically 10 to the power 7 by 400 which is 10 to the power 5 by 4 this is 29 and 10 to the power 3 by 4 this is 250 that's a lot that's a large 250 into 30 approx around 7500 7500 Kelvin this is a very very high temperature it's a huge temperature that you need to generate to get a uh, get violet light that's what it is okay so given below are some famous numbers associated with electromagnetic radiations in different contexts in physics state the part of the electromagnetic spectrum to which each belongs well uh, the first all of this is just you know you can just uh, uh, you can just go back to the textbook and address them, right? Each of them corresponds to a certain. You just need to look at the table with the corresponding uh, frequency and the corresponding uh, corresponding wavelength and the corresponding frequency, and then just look at which spectrum you know uh, which which spectrum lies in what range. Okay. So and similarly, the the fifteenth question is also just a theoretical uh, question, right? Uh, it is something that you know you can just uh, uh, you know you can uh, uh, read up about. In the textbook, uh, so if you look at uh, if you look at the first question, for example, long long wave long distance radio broadcasts use short wave bands. Why? Well, uh, okay, well, you want it to travel long distance, right? So you clearly know that from the formula, lambda v equals c. If you increase the wavelength, you decrease the frequency, right? So what is a band? A band is basically a, a band of frequencies. So if you have a short wave band, then you have a long wavelength, which means it can, it, it can uh, travel long distance without getting attenuated with noise. Okay, so that is that is the reason. So similarly, you know, you have, uh, 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 you have other uh, uh, questions. So here's an interesting question, C. So, uh, optical and radio telescopes are built on the ground, but the X-ray astronomy is only possible from the satellite algorithms. Why? So what happens is, uh, so how do these radio telescopes work? Is that you have a telescope, you have the atmosphere, you have the Earth like this, and some other telescope here. So your signal, you send it, you shoot into the atmosphere. It bounces off because the atmosphere is opaque to some cer some certain. Uh, uh, to some uh, ray, uh, some uh, you know wavelengths, basically it reflects. It acts as a reflector and does not allow it to pass through. So it basically reflects the uh, these uh, uh, the signals, the wavelengths of the radio telescope, and sends them back to ground. Which is why this is the this is the allowed. I mean you can you can you can work with this. However, if you use the same thing for X-ray, the possible the problem is that the atmosphere does not behave as a reflector. The X-ray simply just passes out and it'll never reach the other X-ray tip. So that is not that's not a good thing. So you only you can only operate X-ray from above above the uh, from above the atmosphere. You need a, you need one more a third you need a third satellite on the top here for for the use of communication in X-ray. Okay. Now the small ozone layer on the top of the stratosphere is crucial for human survival. Why? Well, uh, this is, I think it's a very well known answer. I think. Uh, uh, is because to to prevent the harmful UV radiation. UV radiation, uh, ultraviolet uh, ultraviolet uh, rays are again, as you can see, it's a similar concept as to the C part. The the atmosphere, the ozone layer acts as a reflector 
for uv wavelengths whereas it allows other other wavelengths like visible to pass through which is why we can see the sun but the ozone layer is the reflex of the uv because it's opa opaque to that so again uh, some scientists uh, uh, predict that a global nuclear war would would be followed by severe nuclear winter with devastating effects so what happens is if, you know in nuclear bombs you have extreme high amount of gases released right and these gases often you know for uh, uh, you know uh, they accumulate around atmosphere therefore preventing sunlight they are opaque uh, such gases are opaque to uh, visible light itself the problem is that if you block visible light up from the sun then it becomes very very cold right so the heat uh, heat input is significantly lesser and therefore a lot of plants cannot you know cannot thrive without photosynthesis and you know photosynthesis requires sunlight uh, to break down the to the glucose right into co2 and h2o so anyway the, the point is to to make energy uh to to make energy you need uh, uh you need sunlight and if if the gas is released in a, a nuclear bomb uh, in an atomic bomb or a hydrogen bomb uh, make the atmosphere opaque to visible uh, spectrum of ion rays so that would be harmful to life on earth so this, this is a general uh, answer to all the questions in ncert if you are uh, wondering about maxwell's relations maybe this is not necessary i think the chapter is chapter is over right now but if you are very interested in this that's be quite interesting these is these are all called the integral forms of maxwell relations in this uh, okay but you will soon learn that there are something called differential forms of maxwell relation equations not now this is not necessary this is just you know if you are interested in one continue this is something that you can do you will soon later learn that you know all these four equations can be expressed in uh, terms of what is called the divergence and curl so 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 this is something that you are all you will learn later so that similar so you know you have uh, so yeah these are the four uh, equations so these are the four maxwell's equations uh but and using these you can actually do a lot these are basically differential equations and if you solve them you can actually get the entire you know the why you you will understand why we derive you know why the equation of an electric field yeah so basically uh, we we were uh, here right yeah the difference yeah you'll understand why uh, the speed of light equals 1 by square root of uh, uh, mu naught epsilon naught right all of these things seem bit arbitrary right now but they are all derived from these equations you know when you solve the differential equations you will be able to uh, solve all of them so that is something perhaps for a later time but uh, yeah that is basically the uh this of this chapter for from a perspective of uh, boards je and other competitive exams the chapter is just knowing these formulas you know lambda v equals c lambda equals 2 pi by k omega equals 2 pi nu right uh, uh, e is equal e not equals c v not e cross b gives you the direction of you know so e cap cross b cap gives you the direction of the light source uh you know that, that that's it i think at, at the point these are all the formulas that you require for uh, this then you know just need to know the you know the complete maxwell's equation the 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 line integral of the magnetic field is the mu naught times i plus plus mu naught times i displacement and i displacement equals epsilon naught d phi e by dt okay so that is the gist of the chapter